in order for the heart to pump blood, coordination of contraction of the atria and ventricles is absolutely essential. The only purpose of the atria is to provide a last little boost as the ventricles are filling. And so the sequence of contraction must be atria and then ventricles. Once the ventricles are empty, then the, the ventricles relax, the atria contract again, refilling the ventricles, and the ventricles contract, pushing blood uh, through the body, the systemic and pulmonary circuits. So without this, then of course nothing happens as a result of the fact that if the atria and ventricles contract together, no blood can enter the ventricles or the atria, and so no blood would be pumped through the body. So as we look at the conducting system of the heart, what we see is that it facilitates this coordination. Contraction of the heart begins in the sinoatrial node located near the entrance of the superior vena cava in the right atrium. Action potentials are initiated here and they spread out throughout the walls of the right atrium and, and actually through the walls of the left atrium as well. That happens very rapidly and so essentially the right atrium and the left atrium contract together in simultaneous fashion at, at exactly the same time. Um, as we've talked about previously, but you have to remember this for this to make any sense, all the walls, excuse me, all the cells of the atria are connected via gap junctions, and so they make up this unit of muscle tissue referred to as a syncytium. Now, you also ha have to remember, uh, for any of this to make any sense, that the fibrous skeleton of the heart, um, what I'm we're pointing out uh, here, which consists of the valves and the tissue that holds the atrioventricular valves, provides some electrical insulation. And so the only way that an action potential can make its way from the atria down to the ventricles is via the AV node, the bundle of his, which penetrate this fibrous skeleton of the heart. And so that takes us back to our previous story. Action potential begins here, as I'm pointing with the cursor to the sinoatrial node, it spreads out through the right and left atrium, and then it reaches the atrioventricular node. At the atrioventricular node, there's this intentional delay. It takes it about zero, the action potential about 0 0.1 seconds to make its way through the cells of the AV node to the bundle of His. That time is necessary because, that delay is necessary because you need the atria to contract, and then you need a little bit of time to pass before the ventricles contract that time is gained via this intentional delay provided by the atrioventricular node. So once we pass, the action potential passes through the atriovent atrioventricular node, we go through the bundle of His, and then the action potential makes its way into these right and left bundle branches that make their way through the walls of the interventricular septum. And then these two branches, the left bundle branch and the right bundle branch turn, and make their way through the outer wall of both the left ventricle and the right ventricle, giving off these little branches known as Purkinje fibers. The Purkinje fibers are actually what transfer the action potential from the conducting system of the heart to the cardiac muscle cells themselves. And then contraction of the ventricle occurs. We do notice that contraction of the ventricle begins at the apex of the heart, so down here at the bottom of the heart, and makes its way upward. This is adaptive, of course, because the exit, uh, the, the opening um, of both the left ventricle and the right ventricle are located on the upper end of the chambers, um, of course, going to the atria in the case of the left ventricle and the um, pulmonary trunk in the case of the right ventricle. And so the contraction of the heart is compared to squeezing a tube of toothpaste from the bottom upwards this being the, the apex being the bottom of the tube of toothpaste. And so blood is pushed up in this direction, up in this direction towards these exit points. If that wasn't the case, you'd have problems because of course blood would be forced back here into this dead end. As we begin our discussion of action potentials and cardiac muscle cells, I wanted to remind us briefly of the difference between these action potentials and cardiac muscle cells versus skeletal muscle cells. And so we'll do that by looking at a figure back that we uh, came across back in chapter 9. So here, if you follow the cursor on the screen, we have the action potential in a skeletal muscle cell, and we see that it lasts just a couple of milliseconds and is gone, 
And then the tension in the muscle cell develops after that, taking uh, much longer to develop and lasting as long as 100 milliseconds. Here we have a cardiac muscle cell, and we notice that we have an action potential, we have partial repolarization, but then this so-called plateau phase of the action potential lasts a long, long time, over 200 milliseconds, which is over twice the length of time that even the tension developed by a skeletal muscle cell generates. And then we eventually, of course, have repolarization. And then we can see the tension in the cardiac muscle cell lasting in a, a period of time that's approximately equal to the action potential in the cardiac muscle cell. Now we go back to the section of our text here that talks about the mechanism for this. So if we look at these diagrams, we have once again our familiar cardiac uh, muscle action potential. And on the bottom half of this diagram, we have the permeabilities of the cardiac muscle cell to three ions at different points in time in this action potential. Yellow is the permeability to potassium, green the permeability to sodium, and purple the perme permeability to uh, calcium. And what we notice is uh, this, that initially the action potential begins as a result of the entrance of sodium via voltage-gated sodium channels, just like we see in the case of, of skeletal muscle cells. That's what's illustrated in the, by the green uh, line here. So the permeability of the cardiac muscle cell to sodium goes up dramatically, and then, identical to the manner we observe in skeletal muscle cells, it drops very quickly and goes back down to its resting value, uh, meaning that there's no more sodium coming in, obviously. And so if we go up here to the overall charge in the cell, we see that the initial depolarization is a result of the entrance of sodium. But then some other things happen, and so uh, one notable thing that happens is uh, this. We do have these two types of potassium channels, and one type of potassium channel opens uh, very briefly, um, just like it would in the case of skeletal muscle cells. Now, I will caution you, if you look at this picture that I'm pointing to on the YouTube video and the picture in your text, there's something missing in this particular diagram. There's a little hump that should be right there. So the permeability to potassium increases inside the cell ever so slightly. That means potassium is able to leave the cell so you get this initial decline in the charge inside the cell, but then those channels uh, close, um, and even some channels that were open under normal scenarios uh, close, and so that's what you see happening here. Um, the potassium permeability drops significantly after <clears throat> the initial depolarization caused by the entrance of sodium. So that's where we are right now, and of course the closure of those potassium channels results in an increase in charge inside the cell because potassium is, a, is at a higher concentration inside the cell and needs to, or wants to, to diffuse out of the cell. But then, maybe even more importantly, something happens with calcium. And so we have these L-type calcium channels. Uh, L refers to long-lasting, as you remember from chapter nine. They're slower to open, as you can see here following the purple line, but when they do, they increase calcium permeability and calcium flows into the cell. And so that's what we see occurring right here. So one thing is potassium is retained inside the cell, and that's not noted in our diagram here, but it is, of course, discussed in our text. And calcium also is going into the cell, and so that maintains this plateau phase uh, that we see here. Then eventually the plateau phase goes away when these long-lasting, these are very slow-acting calcium channels close, uh, which is what we see in this bullet point, and uh, the potassium uh, channels open, and so the permeability for potassium goes back up and potassium rushes out of the cell. And so those are the factors that contribute to the action potential in a cardiac muscle cell. Now, to be absolutely clear, this is not an SA node cell or an AV node cell. This is not part of the conducting system of the heart. This is a normal cardiac muscle cell. It's not, aut not aut autorhythmic. It just has this wide, broad plateau in the action potential, which of course prevents tetanic contraction in the cardiac muscle cells. Now, we don't talk about the uh, action potentials that are generated in uh, atrial cells, and uh, this is actually a, a ventricular cell. And so atrial cells are very similar, but the plateau is uh, a bit shorter, meaning the overall contraction 
is a little bit shorter, but still long enough to prevent tetanic contractions. We now talk about the action potentials that we observe in the conducting system of the heart. I want to be absolutely clear, these are different than the action potentials we observe in cardiac muscle cells. And these action potentials are similar throughout the conducting system of the heart, but what we see is that in the SA node, and that's what we'll be talking about are the SA node action potentials, they occur a little bit more rapidly, the action potentials do, than, for instance, in the AV node and the rest of the heart. And what this means is that this is the explanation behind that intentional 0.1 second delay that we observed in the AV node. Um, it takes a little while for the action potentials to make their way through there, which allows the atria to fully contract uh, before the ventricles begin to contract. The biggest difference that we see, of course, in the cells of the conducting system of the heart is that they are autorhythmic. Um, and they generate their own action potentials. In other words, they depolarize spontaneously in a regular pattern throughout the life of an individual. And in order to accomplish this, um, then, there are essentially four different ion channels that are involved that we want to briefly discuss. Those are all depicted in the bottom uh, diagram that we see in this particular slide. First, it would be useful to look at the overall membrane, per membrane potential of a cell of the uh, conducting system of the heart, the SA node in this case. So what we see is that we have this slow depolarization until we reach threshold, and then we have an action potential, um, and then we drop back down, we become repolarized, and then we immediately begin this slow depolarization once again. And so over and over and over again, and this is what initiates the beating of the heart. Now, we want to uh, talk about you know what causes uh, this. And so to do that, we need to go down and look at the permeability of the SA node cell to various ions and then talk about the channels that allow that permeability. The first thing we want to notice is this, the uh, potassium uh, permeability. And so in the case of uh, potassium uh, permeability, we see that the cell becomes less and less permeable to potassium as we go through the ascending phase, the depolarizing phase of the action potential in the SA node. So less and less permeable as more and more of these uh, potassium channels close. And then uh, once we become depolarized, uh, these potassium channels open uh, once again very suddenly. And so that raises our potassium permeability and allows us, as we see in our little diagram here, potassium goes out, that allows us to repolarize, and then immediately they close. Um, and we begin this slow decline again, which is going to take us back up into this phase. And so potassium certainly plays a role in uh, this uh, process. Another um, ion channel that, that plays a role is a so-called F-type for funny uh, sodium ion channel. And so these sodium ion channels are odd because they open at negative as opposed to positive voltages. They're voltage gated but open at negative voltages. Every ion channel we've seen up to this point in our class has opened at a positive uh, voltage. And <clears throat> therefore, if we uh, focus in on the blue line, which is the sodium permeability dictated uh, by these F-type channels, then we see that at negative values, sodium permeability is maximum um, and so sodium is going in when we are the cell is, is um, polarized. But then as it becomes more and more depolarized, in other words, the charge goes up and up and up, um, then the permeability of the sodium uh, goes down and down and down until uh, sodium doesn't get in at all when the, um, when the, the cell is depolarized depolarized completely as we see right here. Uh, but then immediately when the cell repolarizes, these sodium channels begin to open once again. And so this contributes, as it's, uh, we see noted here, to this slow rise in depolarization and reaching threshold. Okay, so that's two of the four channels that contribute to the action potential in an SA node. Um, the last two channels are both calcium channels. One you know about and the other you don't. Um, so let's do the one that you don't know about first. So that is a T-type calcium channel, uh, illustrated here in our green line. Um, T stands for transient, and so in this particular case, it's a voltage-gated channel, 
and the calcium, it's going to, the calcium that enters here, and that's what I'm noting right there um, with the pointer, is going to provide a little boost. In other words, the T-type calcium channel is going to provide a little boost that gets us up to threshold, but it's voltage gated, and so as it gets into these uh, voltages uh, associated with threshold, then we instantly see a downturn. Um, and these channels close and the permeability of the cell to calcium as a result of these T-type channels drops. Now lastly, the last channel that contributes to this whole picture is easy. It's one that you already know about. It's an L-type calcium channel for long-lasting uh, calcium, uh, a long-lasting uh, channel. It, it's open for a long period of time. And this is, of course, what gives us that plateau phase that we observed in the cardiac muscle cell action potential. So in this case, you know that these channels open slowly. So um, we have this you know, initial boost to the calcium that's entering as a result of the T-type channels. But then this calcium that we see here is a result of these L-type channels. Um, all this is happening fairly, uh, fairly slowly. You can see 300 milliseconds uh, from here uh, over to uh, here in our overall membrane uh, potential story. And so they open, calcium goes in and in and in, and then eventually you know that those L-type channels close. When the L-type channels close, calcium is no longer entering, but the potassium channels, as we mentioned before, have opened, so potassium is able to exit the cell at this point, and that repolarizes uh, the cell. So all these channels together then allow the conducting cells of all portions of the conducting system of the heart to be autorhythmic. But the SA node, which is what's depicted here, these action potentials happen a little more rapidly than do the action potentials in, for instance, the AV node and the other portions of this conducting system. So this means that under normal conditions, the SA node is the primary pacemaker of the heart. And I guess I should go ahead and say, that if the SA node stops working, then the AV node will uh, exhibit this autorhythmic um, activity, and it will take over as the pacemaker of the heart. And so will the bundle branches, believe it or not. But with each step down the line there, the beating of the heart gets slower and slower, and so eventually, as we'll see in future slides here, a pacemaker is necessary. So to focus on what we just mentioned here regarding the speed of the uh, generation of action potentials, uh, what we notice is the SA node uh, can, generates about 100 beats per minute in the absence of parasympathetic stimulation. That's typically slowed down a little bit by parasympathetic stimulation. Um, so the AV node is only 40 to 60 uh, beats uh, per minute. And so the AV node can, I hope this is clear, the AV node can generate its own action potentials, but it doesn't because those action potentials are, are being conducted to it uh, from the cells of the atria that, of course, those action potentials came from the, the, the um, SA node. And so those action potentials are determining the action or are, are composing the action potentials that go through the AV node. So the SA node is typically the primary pacemaker. We use the term ectopic pacemaker to refer to the situation that occurs when another part of the conducting system besides the SA node generates the action potentials that drive the heart. So examples of this could be, as we mentioned, the AV node, um, but even the bundle of Hiss and Purkinje fibers can act as ectopic pacemakers. Um, the only issue is that the bundle of Hiss and Purkinje fibers generate action potentials at such a slow rate, between 25 and 50 beats per minute, that an artificial pacemaker is necessary for normal activity once uh, these particular parts of the heart begin to act, at, act as ectopic pacemakers. In our next section, we briefly review electrocardiograms. And so electrocardiograms, of course, are electrical activity that's measured at the surface of the body. And as we uh, talked about uh, in one lab long ago, we see that electrocardiograms are valuable uh, because they can tell us something about how those electrical signals are moving through the heart. They don't tell us anything about the functioning of the valves of the heart or anything else uh, related to the movement of blood, but knowing something about the electrical activity of the heart is certainly valuable. As we look at a, an electrocardiogram, uh, we see that we have a P wave, um, which is representative of atrial depolarization, 
And then we have a QRS complex, uh, which is representative of ventricular uh, depolarization that occurs about 0.15 seconds after the P wave. And then we have a T wave, um, which uh, is, tells us that ventricular depolarization uh, is occurring. We don't see anything related, uh, we don't see anything show up for atrial repolarization because the QRS, QRS complex is, is so large in size that it covers up anything that we would observe as a result of the much lesser uh, atrial repolarization. We, of course, realize that the P wave is much smaller than the QRS complex because the cell walls of the atria are much thinner and there simply are, are not as many cells and so the signal is not as strong as is the signal for ventricular uh, depolarization. We can tell something about the health of the heart by looking at the electrocardiogram. So if we look at the bottom of our slide we see that part A shows a, a normal electrocardiogram with P, Q, R, S, T, P, Q, R, S, T in part B, we have a partial block of the transmission of the signal via the AV node that we talked about previously that take the signal from the atria to the ventricles via the conducting system of the heart. So what we notice is that we have P, Q, R, S, T, and then we have a P wave all by itself, P, Q, R, S, T, and then a P wave. And so every other signal is making its way from the atria down to the ventricles and causing contraction of the ventricles. But some signals, like this one, are not making their way through. If we go down to C, what we see is a completely random pattern. P, nothing. P, QRS, T, P, nothing. P, nothing. QRS, uh, P, T. And so uh, it's just all mixed up. And this, is, this would indicate that there's complete blockage of the transmission of the signal between the atria and the ventricles. The ventricles are contracting. The person would not be alive without ventricular contraction. But they're alive because some aspect of the conducting system, either the bundle branches or the Purkinje, Purkinje fibers, are acting as, as an ectopic pacemaker and allowing them to contract, and that's unrelated to the contraction of the atria that's, of course, being triggered by the SA node. It's worth pointing out at this point that a human can survive without atrial contraction. Atrial contraction, as we'll see, contributes to the last 10 to 15 percent of blood that's going to fill up the ventricle, depending on how, how uh, forcefully the heart's beating. Um, but, of course, you can't survive without ventricular contraction. At the end of our section, our book takes a moment to review excitation, contraction, coupling, and cardiac muscle cells. And so I'm going to spend a moment reviewing that. If you're fresh on this material, we covered it very recently, feel free, of course, to, to skip this entirely. But um, if we do the review, then what we see is um, that cardiac muscle uh, does have some characteristics of smooth muscle. Um, and some characteristics of skeletal muscle. It has striations and the same uh, proteins as, as uh, skeletal muscle, but the cells are small, like smooth muscle, a single nucleus, and they have gap junctions. All those characteristics are like smooth muscle. We have the intercalated discs that we talked about previously, found in cardiac muscle cells, shown right here and shown here, permeated by these gap junctions that join the cytosol of two adjacent cardiac muscle cells and overall create a syncytium in the atrial cells and the ventricular cells. If we look at the mechanism of excitation contraction coupling, um, we remember that um, it all starts uh, with the opening of the sodium channels. Sodium uh, rushes into the cell. Sodium <clears throat> then triggers these L-type that we know well now, uh, calcium channels that are voltage gated. Calcium rushes into the cell binds to the ranidine receptors um, that are found in these channels that, that are found in the um, membrane of the sarcoplasmic reticulum. That allows calcium to rush out of the sarcoplasmic reticulum, and then the situation is fam familiar to us. Um, that activates the uh, thin filaments by binding to uh, troponin and moving tropomyosin out of the way. That allows myosin uh, to bind to actin and, and contraction to occur. And then calcium levels are lowered by pumping calcium back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum and relaxation occurs at, at that particular uh, point. Some calcium is pumped back outside the cell as well. So uh, this is just, you know, this is exactly the slide that we had back there on page 376 in, in chapter 9. 
Um, we do have action potentials that move through uh, T tubules. And then we, uh, I think we've, we've talked about all this on, on the previous uh, slide here. The only thing I want to point out is down here at the bottom, the, the last bullet point. This is going to be important to us momentarily in our um, cardiac uh, system discussion. And so what we notice is that uh, these contractions in cardiac muscle cells are different than skeletal muscle cells because only about 30% of the binding sites for myosin on actin are exposed by a single release of calcium. This means that there's a tremendous amount of potential for hormones and autonomic nervous system transmitters to modulate the strength of contraction um, by releasing additional calcium and exposing more of these binding sites. That's an important thing to note, and we'll talk about how that occurs in upcoming sections. Lastly, um, we look at, uh, you know, this is a brief view of what we just talked about in much more detail, so we won't, won't really spend any time on it. Uh, we'll remind ourselves that uh, these L-type calcium channels stands for long-lasting and are extremely important here, and that's the, the reason for this long plateau phase that we observe in the case of, of action potentials in cardiac muscle cells and this prevents tetanic contractions, uh, which would be fatal in the if it occurred in cardiac muscle cells. And then, of course, you know we're aware that all this contraction occurs as a result of pacemakers, and you now understand how those pacemaker cells found in the conducting system of the heart function.